Hello there. Um, we are starting right now. And I have two things to talk about before we begin with the book. First, well, I guess I'll do this first just because it's written on the board. Um, this was homework, and I only got one response. So some of you are not doing your homework. But the one response was really good. So I'm going to share it with you. Um, the question comes from page 43. Beginning of the uh, first full paragraph, it says, A creative center of the educated public that we need will then cultivate a more adequate notion of thought. And that means cultivating the practice. Um, the, the homework was to speculate or to try to state the unstatable concept of what the more adequate notion of thought would be, what it would include. And we received this email, which I really liked. Okay, see if you can get it. You, you can't give it to them in writing, can you, uh, Alessandra? Uh, just a second. Give me 30 seconds. Okay, Alessandro is going to get it for you in writing. And I'm going to read it to you right now. Talking about the London fog. That means the uh, atmospheric conditions in London when it's foggy outside. It's usually kind of chilly and cold and dark and foggy. Okay, Talking about the London fog, Oscar Wilde wrote, Where the cultured catch an effect, the uncultured catch a cold. where the cultured catch an effect, the uncultured catch a cold. Catch an effect. Um, if they're looking at the fog and they say, wow, isn't this an interesting environment? This is spooky, or this is meditative, or they think about the effect. The cultured do that. The uncultured merely catch a cold. They, they get a virus. Uh, the email goes on to say, adapting this to our discussion, we can think, the, think of the cultured as the great writer and of the uncultured as the Cartesian scientist. In my opinion, the more adequate notion of thought would include the capability to catch, through language, the effect and the cold. Actually, I don't think you will catch a cold through language. I.e., the immaterial and the material. So yes, you won't catch a cold, but you'll catch the actual reference. The spiritual and the physical the unstatable and the statable, and create an aesthetic flu. What would that be? I don't know. The thought and the language are inextricably linked, and they grow together. If we try to section them, they bleed because they are alive. And if we insist on the separation, they die. This is so good. I'm going to keep it and think about it more. Well done. Okay. Um, I myself was thinking about the homework. And I also came up with a quote. I was thinking, uh, let me read another sentence of last week's before I tell you about the quote that I want to talk about my homework. 
I'll read again. A creative center of the educated public we need will then cultivate a more adequate notion of thought, and that means cultivating the practice. There must be practiced thinking that brings in consciously with pertinacious and delicate resource the uncartesian reality underlying language and implicit in it what is inexpressible in terms of logic and clarity the unstatable must not be excluded from thought as andreski excludes it when he plumps so naively and demonstratively for individualistic collectivism. I was meditating on what this means. And I remember I have read of characters in books that stargaze, that gaze on the ocean and think deep thoughts that meditate on something in the physical world and get strange impressions. And a lot of times it's considered foolish. And it is considered um, certainly not scientific and certainly not uh, legitimate or logical or even real. And I thought about times when I myself have thought deep thoughts while out on a walk looking at nature. When I used to take walks at sunrise or at sunset and I would think about God and I would think about the way life is. And sometimes I would laugh at myself for being so silly for not having my feet on the ground, for having my head in the the clouds. And then I remembered this morning as I was thinking about it, the words of a song. And that song is called, Could It Be? by Michael Card. Michael Card is a theologian and a singer-songwriter. He is a trained seminary trained theologian and his lyrics are deep and reflect a mystical relationship with God and um, these words came to me from one of his songs the words are and I think Alessandra is putting them up for you to read as I quote them um Could it be, you meaning God, could it be you make your presence known so often by your absence? Could it be the questions tell us more than answers ever do? Could it be that you would really rather die than live without us? Could it be the only answer that means anything? is you. It's a question you can't answer, an answer you cannot express, that the gentle man of sorrows is the source of happiness. You'll never solve the mystery of this magnetic man, for you must believe to understand. I remember when I used to take walks, I would listen to my iPod and I would listen to Michael Card and I would think these thoughts so full of paradox, so full of unstatable, intuitive weight. And I would think that it was foolish of me, but now I think it's wise. So when the book says there must be practiced thinking that brings in consciously 
the uncartesian reality underlying language and implicit in it i think part of the practice is taking seriously these flights of fancy and being open to the truth that is intuitively apprehended when we are in the mood to ponder so that's my homework um there was one other thing i promised to talk about this week but i think i'm going to move it to the end of class cuz it doesn't fit in to our discussion i think we'll move right into the book but the topic is inerrancy of the bible and what happened to me when they didn't want me to graduate from seminary because i didn't agree with inerrancy i'll tell you about that at the end so stay tuned so let's begin with page 43 i will reread the paragraph from last week and perhaps make a comment or two but not much and then move into the new material okay page 43 a creative center of the educated public we need will then cultivate a more adequate notion of thought and that means cultivating the practice there must be practiced thinking that brings in consciously with pertinacious and delicate resource the uncartesian reality underlying language and implicit in it what is inexpressible in terms of logic and clarity the unstatable must not be excluded from thought as andreski excludes it when he plumps so naively and demonstratively for individualistic collectivism and this brings us to the importance in relation to my theme of creative literature all major literary creation is concerned with thought thought that men of andreski's bent should take seriously that is a constatation the force of which i have tried to make plain in a discussion of one of the world's great novels little dorrit in that work as the challenged critique must aim at bringing out dickens making a characteristically profound and necessarily creative inquest into society in his time tackles in sustained and unmistakably deliberate thought the basic unstatable that eludes the logic of cartesian clarity and a philosophical discourse too taking it as granted that life is the artist's concern he develops in full pondering consciousness the uncartesian recognition that while it is there only in individual lives it is there and its being there makes them lives what the word life represents and evokes is not to be disposed of under the rubric of hypos hypostatization or collectivity or linguistic convenience i want to point out just a few things in that paragraph before we move right on to the new material first in the fourth line it talks about bringing in consciously the uncartesian reality underlying language and implicit in it and later he later in the paragraph he says that dickens tackles in sustained and unmistakably deliberate thought unmistakably deliberate thought the unmistakably modifies deliberate we cannot make a mistake dickens is being deliberate about the uncartesian 
unstatable, difficult to apprehend impression that he is creatively drawing from his society. So in the beginning it says we must be conscious about this kind of thought. The kind of thought tends to be unconscious. We must bring it to the conscious level. And this can be embarrassing because it sounds what we call in English flighty. It doesn't seem grounded in logic. It cannot be stated clearly and proven. When you say, I think reality is thus, you are on thin ice. You're talking about an impression you have received. But we must bring it consciously out there into the public arena in order for the creative understanding of mankind to continue to develop. Dickens uh, was deliberate about the development of these unstatable themes in Little Dorrit. Okay, I think that's... Uh, Oh, another thing I just wanted to point out. It occurred to me this morning as I was preparing that this concept Andreski have has of individualistic collectivism is what we call an oxymoron. Oxymoron. An oxymoron is a union of two mutually exclusive concepts into one thing. The typical example of an oxymoron is military intelligence. Military intelligence. People call this an oxymoron because they are asserting that the military is stupid. It's stupid to stand up and shoot each other. There is no wisdom in war. So to say military intelligence is oxymoronic. There is no intelligence in the military. So. Individualistic collectivity is also oxymoronic. There is no individualistic collectivism. This is something Andreski has essentially made up as the only alternative to individualism. So we see how inadequate the Cartesian either or is, producing something that doesn't exist as the only possible a recourse for reality. Um, if the other option doesn't work out, individualism. Okay, moving on. We're going to start with the paragraph at the bottom of page 43, beginning with emphasizing the affinity. Emphasizing the affinity between Dickens and Blake. I point out how the scheme implicit in the cast of sharply different main persona who interact in Little Dorrit applies an equivalent of Blake's distinction between the selfhood and the identity. Making and enforcing this point is inseparable from observing how Dickens' art insists on creativity as the characteristic of life. The selfhood asserts its rights and possesses from within its egocentric self-enclosure. The identity is the individual being as the focus of life, life as heuristic energy creativity, and 
from the human person's point of view, disinterestedness. It is impossible to doubt that Dickens, like Blake, saw the creativity of the artist as continuous with the general human creativity that, having created the human world we live in, keeps it renewed and real. This day-to-day -day work of collaborative creation includes the creating of language, without which there couldn't have been a human world. In language, as I have said, the truth I will refer to as life and lives, the basic unstatable, which, lost to view and left out, disables any attempt to think radically about human life, is most open to recognition and most invites it. In major literary works, we have the fullest use of language. and intelligent study of literature brings us, inevitably, to the recognition from which, in his thinking, Andreski cuts himself off. I have in mind, of course, the importance, and that is the nature, of the discipline of thought that should be associated with English, the university study. One can say with pregnant brevity that the achievement of the aim in vigorous established practice would be a potent emergence from the Cartesian dualism. Potent here means fruitful in positive consequences a new realization of the nature and the pervasiveness of creativity in life and thought would be fostered. There is nothing that the world in our time more desperately needs. Okay, this is a paragraph which would not mean a lot to me if I had not studied it carefully and taken apart the sentences. So we'll go back and study sentence by sentence to see what he is saying. Emphasizing the affinity between Dickens and Blake, I point out. Dot, dot, dot. This first phrase, emphasizing the affinity between Dickens and Blake, really belongs with the second portion of the sentence. He is saying that as he points out what he is about to point out, he wants to emphasize the affinity between Dickens and Blake. Affinity in this context means similarity. So he is saying that William Blake in his poetry and writing is similar to Dickens in Little Dorrit. So there is a similarity between these two bodies of work which he would like to emphasize with what he's about to point out. So, I point out how the scheme implicit in the cast of sharply different main persona, persona, persona um, who interact in Little Dorrit. Okay, uh, it's a complex thought with several uh, parts to it. Okay, so I point out means he's going to make this point in his essay, which he's already referenced, how the scheme, what is a scheme? A scheme is a plan or a tactical arrangement. So the suggestion with that word is that Dickens has a plan 
to show forth something by having a cast of characters that are very different. However, uh, on page 42, um, in the middle of the first paragraph, speaking of Andreski, Levis says, the tactic, if what is so obviously uncalculating can be called that. And um, so I want to, in contrast, point out that Levis is suggesting that Dickens has a plan, uh, has a method. It is a tactic he is using to make a point that he brings in widely different kinds of characters in Little Dorrit. Okay, so uh, the scheme implicit in the cast of sharply different main personae. So the scheme is within this cast of, cast of different people who interact in Little Dorrit. Okay, all of this it applies an equivalent of Blake's distinction between the selfhood and the identity. Okay, now, Olavo told me that Blake makes a distinction between the selfhood and the identity, and it is represented a little bit like this. The self. Use of the word self implies a self-centered ego, a person whose focus is toward within, a person whose interest is his own welfare, a person who has walls to keep himself to himself. It is an inward-focused ego. In contrast, we have uh, the identity, which is more like a soul. You could use the word ego here. Over here, you would use the word soul. Whoa. We fixed this. Okay, maybe that's more stable. Identity. Now, the emphasis of this is outward, shining outward. There is a disinterestedness. Now, when we use the word disinterested, it's often coupled with the word love or affection. Disinterested means I am not loving you for myself. I am loving you for you. I am not serving you to get gain. I am serving you that you may get gain. That's what disinterested is. It does not mean that the person is not interested in you. Quite the contrary. It means they are not interested in themselves. They are interested only in you and in others outside themselves. So the identity more or less should be seen as something which shines. Shines out. Like, a, like the sun. So the identity is a free soul without walls and boundaries that just emanates itself into the world in love. 
Now, this is the concept I got from talking to Olavo. And I guess it comes from Blake. He didn't show me where it came from or how. But um, in Little Dorrit, we have this kind of character that's, there's an, well, there are several characters that are extremely selfish and shriveled up into themselves. And then you have Little Dorrit herself, who's one of these, and some others. So you have givers and you have takers. So in Little Dorrit, uh, emphasizing the affinity between Dickens and Blake, I point out how the scheme implicit in the cast of sharply different main personae who interact in Little Dorrit applies an equivalent. So um, Dickens' scheme applies this concept, an equivalent concept, to uh, a very different situation. Applies an equivalent of Blake's distinction between the selfhood and the identity. Making and enforcing this point is inseparable from observing how Dickens' art insists on creativity as the characteristic of life. Now, creativity belongs here. It shines outward. And the suggestion is that these people are alive. And that these people are just dying by inches. And they are also uncreative. The selfhood asserts its rights and possesses from within its egocentric self-enclosure. The identity is the individual being as the focus of life. So this soul is simply a manifestation of a greater energy called life, called creativity, of which this is one expression, one example. This is one vessel for the energy called life. Life as heuristic energy. I believe, I looked up the word heuristic and I think I remember it meaning creative. Could be wrong, maybe you should look it up. But anyway, I think it means creative energy. Creativity. And from the human person's point of view, disinterestedness. It is impossible to doubt that Dickens, like Blake, saw the creativity of the artist as continuous with the general human creativity that, having created the human world we live in, keeps it renewed and real. Keep in mind that human world does not just mean the material world we occupy. It means the, the human society, the norms of society, the habits, the manners, the perceptions, the thoughts, the lifestyle, all that makes a human experience human. That is the human world. It is a third order um, concept. So um, Levis is ass asserting that Dickens and Blake saw the creativity of the artist as continuous with the general human creativity. So again, we are in the stream of human creativity through the years. And any one artist is part of the flow, channeling the human creative spirit. Channeling um, means it is moving through you. 
that, having created the human world we live in, keeps it renewed. So the world continues being recreated by all of us every day and keeps it real. This day-to-day -day work of collaborative creation includes the creating of language, without which there couldn't have been a human world. Okay, day-to-day -day emphasizes that it is a continuous process. Day-to-day -day work of collaborative creation. A collaborative creation means all of us are working together and the net result is that hum the human world is being added to and expanded and redefined continuously, renewed and refreshed by all of our creative contributions as we live life. And it includes the creation of language. And we've spoken before of how language continues to evolve. It continues to grow, to borrow words from other places and give them new meanings, to create new words, to fit new ideas and new concepts. The development of language mirrors the development of human culture. Language without which there couldn't have been a human world because language is the medium in which we function. It's the currency through which we interact. In language, as I have said, the truth I will refer to as life and lives the basic unstatable which, lost to view and left out, disables any attempt to think radically about human life, is most open to recognition and most invites it. Let's get the core of the sentence first, then we will understand the clauses. In language, this is the core. I've already just picked it apart. This is the core. In language, the truth, big bracket here, the truth is most open to recognition and most invites it. In language, the truth is most open to recognition and most invites it. Um, the truth is something which we're going to talk about what the truth is in a second. But for now, the truth is something which Andreski does not recognize at all. Cartesians do not recognize the truths that Levis is talking about. So these uh, difficult to apprehend, unstatable truths, and even the fact that such a realm exists, is recognizable through language. And through language, um, the truth invites recognition. So basically, 
what it's what the main sentence is saying is that language sits out there in the public arena with all of its undeniable layers of meaning and it says look at me i am a mirror of reality look at me you can look at the reference of my words or you can read between the lines to the emotions or you can read behind what i'm saying to my motives or you could go underneath to my underlying assumptions you can scratch the surface or dig deeply and you know you can do this it is legitimate look at me i am a picture of reality reality is the same way there is a surface reality and there is a deeper reality behind the things we can touch so in language the truth is most open to recognition the truth that reality is multi-layered is most recognizable in language and also language itself invites people to recognize the truth by its very nature language pulls people in they can hardly help but read between the lines and give some legitimacy to the intuitions they take away so what's in there all of it modifies the truth so it's telling us more about the truth the truth i will refer to as life and lives the truth he is going to refer to as life and lives so i suspect as we read on he will be talking about the truth about life i have spoken of the truth in terms of reality what is reality like he will be talking about what is life like what are human lives characterized by okay so the truth which i will refer to as life and lives the basic unstatable basic unstatable we've been talking about which lost to view and left out disables any attempt to think radically about human life okay life and lives the truth is the basic unstatable which if you leave it out as andreski does leave it out of your thinking it will disable your ability to think radically um think radically about human life about human life uh thinking radically means thinking outside the box outside the box is a big phrase in english this is an idiom which means don't follow established rules be creative 
come up with new and original ideas. When children are little, they have crayons. And if they color in the lines, some people will say they are uncreative. They should color outside the lines to express themselves. That's related to this phrase, outside the box. Think radically. A radical is someone who does not obey the establishment. A person who does something new and different and um, destroys the icons of culture. So, the truth about life and lives, which is the basic unstatable, which if you don't have it, your ability to think radically about human life will be disabled. Okay? So, it is the necessary truth um, to enable you to think about human life radically. So all of that goes in there. So in language, the truth, which I will refer to as life and lives, the basic unstatable, which lost to view and left out, disables any attempt to think radically about human life, is most open to recognition and most invites it. Okay, moving on. If ever you have any questions about anything, please send them in and we'll stop class and answer them. Sorry. I thought I was spilling my drink. Okay. In major literary works, we have the fullest use of language. Now remember, in language, we have the most potent invitation to recognize the nature of life. And in major literary works, we have the fullest use of language. So you get Levis's point that the study of literature is foundational to thought. And intelligent study of literature brings us inevitably to the recognition from which, in his thinking, Andreski cuts himself off. Okay. So this is a restatement of this same idea. In major literary works, we have the fullest use of language, best opportunity to recognize the nature of life and intelligent study of literature, i.e. Um, the kind that Levis recommends, brings us inevitably, which means in every case it will bring us, to the recognition of life, of truth, from which in his thinking Andreski cuts himself off. To cut yourself off means to separate yourself um, permanently and without any remedy. Finally, separates himself. It's like cutting off your arm. You're not going to get it back. Andreski has cut himself off from the recognition of deeper truth. However, by intelligent study of literature, we are brought to the recognition about human life that Andreski has cut himself off of. He can't understand it. I have in mind, of course, the importance, and that is the nature, of disciplined thought that should be associated with English, the university study. Um, when he says he has in mind, that means when he wrote the previous sentence, he was thinking about. Okay, the previous sentence 
refers to intelligent study. He had in mind by intelligent study uh, the kind of disciplined thought which should be associated with English the university study, practical criticism. One can say with pregnant brevity that the achievement of the aim in vigorous established practice would be a potent emergence from the Cartesian dualism. If one can say something, then that is another way of saying it is true. So that's a construction that means it is true. One can say, with pregnant brevity, brevity suggests short and to the point. Pregnant suggests fat and future-oriented and full, full of possibilities. Pregnant and brevity are sort of opposites. So pregnant brevity. Brevity is a good thing, but the pregnant sort of belies it and suggests that you're saying a lot more than appears. Pregnant brevity. Um, that the achievement of the aim, what aim? The aim of training people to think the aim of cultivating practiced thinking in the study of English in the university. If they achieve the aim, then what they will have done is taught their students to approach literature intelligently and to receive the reward of recognition of the nature of life, a wise and intuitive apprehension of reality and of human life. So the aim, to achieve the aim, you will have students who have successfully studied literature and received wisdom. That's the aim. So one can say with pregnant brevity that the achievement of the aim in vigorous established practice would be a potent emergence from the Cartesian dualism. So achievement of the aim of teaching students to think intelligently. In vigorous established practice, that means it is done vigorously. It, in other words, it's done strongly and energetically and in a lively manner. vigorous established practice. Established means it has been going on for some years. Generation after generation of students has been effectively influenced. So to achieve the aim in vigorous established practice would be a potent emergence from the Cartesian dualism. He uses would be because it isn't actually a fact. If we did this, then the result would be that. But since we have not done this, the, re the result is not that. Okay, so it would be um, a potent emergence from the Cartesian dualism. Remember I told you before that potent means able to father a child, literally. And here he defines his use of the word potent. Uh, he says potent here means fruitful in positive consequences. So a potent emergence from the Cartesian dualism. The image suggests that the Cartesian dualism is sterile. It does not bear fruit. It cannot have children. It is barren. But uh, to achieve the aim 
and establish it would be a potent emergence and would have fruitful good results. Imagine being liberated from a dualism into a, a world of possibilities that number as the spectrum. That's quite a freedom. A new realization of the nature and pervasiveness of creativity in life and thought would be fostered. And there's nothing in, that the world in our time more desperately needs. So a realization of the nature and pervasiveness of creativity in life and thought. I'm wondering, why does the world need a realization of the nature and pervasiveness of creativity in life and thought? I'm going to give you a chance if anyone out there viewing live would like to answer that question. I want to write it on the board and ask you to try to make a suggested answer. The question is, why does our world need a new realization of the nature and pervasiveness of creativity in life and thought? I'm going to write that phrase first. A realization of the nature and pervasiveness of creativity and life in life and thought. A realization, a realization of the nature and pervasiveness. of creativity in life and thought. Why do we need this? What effect would it have on our world today if a new realization of the nature and pervasiveness of creativity in life and thought became more general? What would be the effect? Give it some thought for a moment and write anything you can send to me. I'm going to give you a couple seconds. If you don't answer now, maybe it will be homework. And Alessandro, if you have any thoughts, I'd be interested in those too. I am going to jot down my ideas right now, too, so that I can share them also.
Okay, well, maybe we'll do it for homework. Okay, people apparently on the chat board are saying that they need more time to think about this, and I think it would be an excellent homework assignment. Um, I'm tempted to share my thought right now. Alessandro, do you have a thought? Okay, he doesn't either. Um, I'm tempted to share my thought because it is an example of the kind of flighty, uh, free association kind of creative thinking that I believe we are talking about. My thought is not definitive logical, clear, and obviously flowing from these words. It is an intuitive response. And I would like you, perhaps, to give your intuitive response for homework. But I will share with you my thought. Today, and then I think I'll talk about inerrancy. So we'll probably stop here and... Uh, move on next week, because uh, I want to talk about this, and then I want to talk about inerrancy. So um, this is my thought. Today I read an urgent prayer request from a friend of mine who lives in Pakistan. My friend is a missionary to Hindus in a Muslim nation and there is a lot of violence against Christians in the area and there is a story in the news right now uh, that there is a small church in Florida called Dove World Outreach Center it is a very small church, less than 50 members. And they have decided to commemorate September 11th, which is the day that the airplanes crashed into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and killed so many people. This church is going to commemorate 9-11 by burning several hundred Korans. And apparently the Muslim world has already reacted with outrage, as has um, the American establishment. Everybody thinks this is a bad idea. And my friend from Pakistan wrote a letter saying that last week a whole village of Christians was wiped out, killed for less than this in their area. And that people are killed for a rumor, unfounded and untrue rumor, that they have disrespected a Quran. If you want to have your neighbor killed and he is a Christian, simply tell someone he disrespected the Quran and he will be killed. So my friend is afraid that if this church goes through with um, burning the Qurans, they will incite horrible violence and bloodshed all over the world. Now, when I read this, I am struck by the word, a realization of the nature and pervasiveness of creativity. So in a sense, it's a realization that creativity is out there. It's a realization that humanity is constantly innovating, constantly changing things creatively. And to understand the nature of creativity is growth and life 
and health. And to understand that the creativity is pervasive means it is everywhere. There is no place where creativity is not a characteristic of life. In contrast, we have um, outmoded and destructive traditions that people impose upon themselves. For example, the tradition that if someone disrespects a Quran, you should kill them. The holy war idea of, of bloodshed and violence is part of an ancient tradition. But the world is changing and people have new ideas. And can't we make room for new ideas? So I'm thinking if a realization of the nature and pervasiveness of creativity in life and thought became common, we would have less um, violence and bloodshed, which is rooted in ignorance and prejudice and hatred. So that's my thought. What do you think would be the result in the world if a realization of the nature and pervasiveness of creativity in life and thought became common? So send me some ideas and I'll share them next week. And, um, and then we'll begin from there next week. Now, two weeks ago, I spoke to you about an experience I had with the doctrine of biblical inerrancy. Now, I'm going to erase this, so I hope you've already written it down. This is homework, so that I can use the board. Okay, biblical inerrancy. Okay, Christians have the idea that the Bible is the word of God. Now, what it means for it to be the word of God is not clearly defined anywhere. The Bible says many things about itself about scriptures. Jesus had a certain attitude toward the Old Testament scriptures. And there are phrases in the New Testament that suggest that scripture is inspired by God. All of that is the kernel of a doctrine. It is like the cake. And the icing on the cake are the exact details of what it means. And many people have a lot of trouble differentiating between the kernel of an idea and the details. We have a phrase in English called, the devil is in the details. And that is very true in theology. The devil is in the details. 
people can all agree that the Bible is the word of God, but literally kill each other over the details of what that means. One of the details is the evangelical doctrine of biblical inerrancy. Biblical inerrancy is the idea that the Bible contains no errors. Hence the name inerrancy. Now, the first thing that you have to understand is that this doctrine is part of a system of interpreting the Bible scientifically. That means every word has to have a precise meaning and every concept has to be supported specifically and exhaustively and proven. So we must define what errors are. And so there actually are whole books written about this, defining the system of bibliology that rests upon the doctrine of inerrancy. Bibliology, it's a study in seminaries, uh, evangelical. So an error is defined in this context as um, actually, there's several characteristics, all of which must be true. <laughs> the first one is um, the error must exist in the autographs. The autographs are the original manuscripts as penned by the original author. And they don't exist today. They are not extant. So right there, you can see that it is not possible to prove whether the Bible is truly inerrant because we don't have the autographs. And a person can say, well, in the original autograph, this error was not there, but it has been added later. Okay, so an error, first of all, would be in the autographs. Secondly, it would be um, where the author is teaching an eternal truth. So where the author So it has to do with the intent of the author. And there are others as well. Um, and then there's a whole raft of things that are not considered errors. For example, when Jesus says the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, that is not considered an error because the author was not trying to make a scientific statement about the science of seeds and the size of seeds. He was trying to make a statement about um, the nature of faith. So. Anything to do with uh, science is not considered an error. Um, or it, it, there's just a whole bunch of things that are not considered errors because they don't have to do with the intent of the author. Also, the author's intent is something which itself is subject to interpretation. So I'm not trying to teach a course about inerrancy. 
what I'm trying to do is explain that the concept is an enormous systematic theology. It's an enormous construct resting on a few truths of scripture but adding detail after detail after detail. And in the end, you end up with an approach to the Bible which requires you to send all of the passages through these flow charts where you try to discern the intent of the author and try to discern the context, try to discern the main point, etc., etc., so that you can explain away anomalies. For example, in one gospel, uh, the, the account of Peter denying Jesus says he denied him before the cock crowed. In another one, it says he denied him three times before the cock crowed twice. And I think it might have said something even different in a third. And there, I've read, personally read, a you know several page explication of how Peter ran here and ran there and ran here and ran there. And in the end, he ended up denying Jesus like seven or eight times. And the cock ended up crowing ten times. Also, that each of them can be true. There's a need to harmonize apparent contradictions within this system. So, because you can't leave a contradiction, or else it blows the concept. So, my problem with biblical inerrancy is that I believe it puts a burden on the reader to have to interpret in all these ways, all of which are man-made and from a scientific viewpoint. And I don't think it's helpful. So what I tried to do when I uh, changed the doctrinal statement I was supposed to sign from biblically inerrant to scripture is inspired, I was trying to get back to the core that everyone agrees with and dispense with all the details. And they couldn't um, understand or recognize what I was asserting. They simply said, are you an inerrantist or, are you, or do you affirm error in the scripture? In other words, do you believe there's no errors or do you believe there are errors according to this definition? So they wouldn't let me out of their system. And I kept trying to sidestep this technical definition of error to go back to what I believe about inspiration. And they kept bringing me back to the either errors or no errors. Well, a student wrote and asked me to explain this further and also to tell what happened. The truth is, I don't know what happened. I know only the outcome for me. When I left the meeting, there was no agreement among the authorities that were interviewing me. They were not satisfied. And we had to receive a letter in the mail approving us to go to commencement and graduate. So the letter was supposedly a formality saying, yes, all of your requirements are filled. You are approved for graduation. But I never got the letter because I hadn't signed the statement. Or I had signed, but I had altered it. So after this um, meeting, I still didn't get the letter until the very day before the graduation ceremony, I received a letter saying I was approved to commence, and I got my diploma. So I never knew what happened. I never knew whether they took a vote. I don't know what they did, but they gave me my diploma, and I never signed the statement, I don't think. I mean, I know I actually signed, but I changed it, and I don't believe I ever recanted, but 
I don't know. That's my memory. So don't forget to do your homework. Please try to imagine what is the importance of recognizing the nature and pervasiveness of creativity in the world and how it would impact our society if people had a better understanding of that. Send it in, and uh, I'll see you next week. By the way, um, check the website. We're putting up more information about coming to the United States to study. And we can only receive a few students, but I would like to invite you to apply so that maybe you'll be one of the ones that we're able to invite to come. So check the website, and I hope to receive an application from, from, from you all. Thank you. Bye. Question? Frederica, do you believe that the time we spend reading good literature is real uh, life experience or experience of life? I ask this because I've been much criticized or greatly criticized for wasting my time reading and reading and reading instead of enjoying the quote unquote real life. Okay, the question is do I think that the time spent reading literature is real life experience because the student has been criticized for reading too much and not participating in real life experiences. Um, the answer to your question is that I think that the time spent reading is um, valuable. Now, I wouldn't say it is real life experience, but I would, would say that it is as valuable in different ways as real life experience, and that ultimately it will produce wisdom in a similar way that real life experience can. Um, and in fact, it will produce wisdom uh, in a different way as well, more effectively than real life experience. However, I also know that some people might use reading to avoid real relationships. And I think a balance must be struck. I think if people are saying this, it could be one of two things. A, they don't value reading, so they think it's a waste of time. Or B, they think you overdo it because you are neglecting relationship with them. Um, I think this is something to pray and ask God about if there's any question about whether you're doing the right thing by your friends. It's possible that it is purely prejudice on their part against reading. Um, but I personally think reading is not a waste of time. Um, I think that it is as valuable as other kinds of life experience, especially since a lot of life experience is repetitive. For example, maybe your friends go out and play soccer every evening after work. Well, how many times do you need to play soccer? You can spare some time for reading. So that's my opinion. But I don't know. I, th I think it's good to read. Anything else? Okay. If if there are no more comments, uh, we'll go ahead and sign off and see you next Thursday.